Some writers create spellbounding dramas with little concern for planning ahead. Some writers prefer traditional outlines to keep the process. And both are right. Both sets of writers get the job done. It's difficult to create a compelling story so writers should always lean on their strengths. But it's my enduring belief that no matter where or how a movie script starts, the finished product always adheres to the exact same 29 point story structure. Enola Holmes is my exhibit A. A tight focus on the core elements of a protagonist's personality, inner conflict, and situation. Enola literally introduces herself. Not as nuanced as the sequence can be, so now I'm already obligated to cobble together a second video. Something in a different tone, perhaps? This also serves as the introduction to Eudoria, but as Enola says, she's her whole world. This interaction is the protagonist. The idolization of this strong and motivated woman builds a strong, motivated girl. And while it's tempting to label Eudoria's disappearance as the story's exciting incident, it's not. We'll get to that momentarily. Eudoria's absence is just as integral to Enola's core character as her presence. And rounding out Enola's character is the clue box. She's destined to become a lady detective after all. Where, why, and how the protagonist exists in their world with a focus on why they don't quite fit in. Enola's status quo is literally and figuratively her brothers, Mycroft and Sherlock. Mycroft is the face of the patriarchy in every way except subtlety, and Sherlock is the framework to which she will adopt during her arc, the consulting detective. Mycroft's quick dismissal of the goddamn flowers displays his separation from Sherlock about the themes, and of course, the investigation excludes the woman. A singular event that's never happened before, and is destined to lead the protagonist away from their status quo. The true exciting incident, Enola stiffens her backbone in the presence and contempt of the patriarchy a la Mycroft. And in doing so, she launches her story, not the mystery of the case. This is the origin of THE Lady Detective. An examination of what's different in light of the something new, what's the same in spite of it, and how it deepens the conflict with the status quo. The absence of her mother and presence of her brothers threatens to displace Enola from her feminism bubble, redirecting her toward a vastly different adult life. Enola responds with ridicule until she understands the full scope of her trajectory. She pleads with the patriarchy but she's dismissed entirely, and dear God, those are some crazy eyes, Sam Claflin. The discovery that things are less than ideal, or an exploration of how badly things are. Despite Sherlock's subtle sympathies toward his sister, he keeps himself distant with sloppy excuses. And, oh yeah, there's a mystery? Mama Holmes is off somewhere, and only Enola seems distressed, which I guess is the family dynamic, but that's a miss too. Armed with a well-worded segue, Enola suspects there's something amiss about the clue box. The protagonist dedicates their effort to a specified goal, which is almost always smaller in scope or scale to the primary objective that dominates the third act. Enola is drawn to the clues and begins unraveling them logically, though her insight is tied to her emotions, a dichotomy Sherlock famously disproves of. That transitions into the clarified objective of running away to solve the mystery her damn self. Screw you, patriarchal gender roles! And just as Enola completes her first proactive move, her primary objective slithers in over her shoulder. Burn Gorman, the adversary agent, perfectly understands his mission, and so does the patriarchy. A brief checklist of the story elements needed for the second act and how they might be utilized. Enola in action? Check. The hapless victim? Check. The relentless baddie? Check. Thrilling heroics? Check. The singular event that launches the protagonist into the wild jungle of the second act, also called an oh shit moment. They jump from a moving train, oh shit. 
the protagonist must learn all new rules and expectations that are distinct to this adventure. Shelter to Nola is placed in the middle of open countryside, in the presence of an nincompoop, and Sherlock is forced to look at his sister as his sister, and not a case suspect. The protagonist showcases their ability to grow in areas this adventure requires, typically through external means. Enola and Tewksbury combine forces to make a meal. They connect on what else they might have in common. They positively progress to London, where they split up. Aww, he's so sad. Characters face legitimate and understandable reasons to deviate from their stated convictions, agendas, or desires. Her resolve is tested by a chaotic London introduction. Mycroft squabbles over Sherlock's crumbling resolve to adhere to his division of labor. Damn you, Henry Cavill! And the shopkeeper fails her resolve to keep her shop respectable at the sight of cold, hard cash. And that room will test some resolve too, I'm here to tell ya. A tightly packed series of problems that vex the protagonist at damn near every turn. Now we're securely nestled and oriented into the second act, it's time for Nola to begin the hunt for her mother. She spits out coded flags, chases an old clue to an old family friend, teases out some of the conspiracy, uncovers a well-labeled laboratory, then runs into Bern Gorman again. The protagonist evolves internally by utilizing everything they've gathered and learned. The first thing Enola does is pretend to acquiesce to the patriarchy. This man wants her to die, so she acts the part. Oh yeah, she's leveling up. Jiu-jitsu, boxing, this corkscrew thing, though not successful, saved by her lady disguise, and then her remedial chemistry lessons. Journey-weary characters reconcile the reality of their ongoing situation with who they were in the first act. Enola balances priorities of two people she now feels loyalty to, choosing one over the other. She feigns loyalty to Sherlock in desperation to her loyalty to Tewksbury, which is promptly tested by Lestrade. A singular event that strikes at the protagonist's core conflict. Enola is recognized as more than she looks and claims, by a man of authority. Her journey cannot go backwards from here. Characters find a safe harbor that also provides needed answers for both external and internal conflicts. Sherlock deduces Miss Grayston's involvement and verifies that his kid sister is safe. Then he's promptly dressed down as complicit to what Enola and Eudoria are fighting against. Thus his arc bends toward using his privilege to shield and to guide this budding sleuth. Lestrade reports to Mycroft, confirming his own deductions, and Enola finds Tewksbury's treehouse staging area. The protagonist's clarified objective from the first act is realized in part or in whole, though it's meaningless without the completion of the primary objective. She deduces past the misdirections and further into the clues than any of the villains, but this victory is empty as long as Tewksbury is being hunted so many miles away. In the most dramatic, empty victory of this story, she has the culprit in her hands. Ah! Who would have guessed that a woman obsessed with tradition is the lone wolf lifting up the whole of the British patriarchy? Er, not, not Mycroft, the real patriarchy? Sorry, sorry. And even catching Tewksbury is empty because, well, Bern Gorman is still out there. An existential conflict that wounds the protagonist's sense of self, worldly identity, and their journey. Alone has an ordeal with her unwanted romantic feelings. Then she has an ordeal over her basic freedom and Tewksbury's very life. The death of Enola Holmes, Lady Detective. And the forced rebirth of a quiet, obedient female. Patriarchy knows best. An undeniable win for the protagonist, typically in direct connection to the rebirth. 
as Enola's idolization of her mother wanes, her faith in her own autonomy solidifies more than ever. A strong, motivated woman rallying. And boom, Sherlock now sees her as a true equal reward. A grand loss, directly connected to the protagonist's newfound inability to quit the journey. Enola must acknowledge and confront her vulnerability, where she came from, and when she needs to accept help. A thematic freefall tied directly to the heavy price. The chaotic escape, a thrilling car chase, the chaotic solution to the case. Did you solve it before she did? A singular event that robs the protagonist of seemingly any chance of success. Two largely sheltered teenagers arrive at the showdown armed with only theories. The protagonist is incapable of returning to their original persona and must turn to face the primary objective. That's not very sneaky. He's armed with something a little stronger than theories. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh no. Oh no. Welp. The protagonist moves towards the climax while utilizing the major swings and sneaky misdirections of the story. As before, Enola pulls herself together after an ass whooping from Burn Gorman. As before, Eudoria's memory floats to her with inspiration. As before, the corkscrew and holy baby Jesus and a home screaming, who do you work for, is meta familiar territory. So I'm counting it. The final confrontation between the protagonist and the antagonistic force. The true culprit is finally revealed. Uh oh. The villain monologue that should go here already happened earlier, so this sequence kind of flashes by. The singular event where the protagonist finally confronts their place in the status quo. The direct aftermath of the climax. The cinematic denouement, if you will. Resurrection! Some tidy exposition to fill in where Enola left off by Sherlock. Thanks, Sherlock. And the official resurrection of Enola Holmes, super sleuth. The consequences of the climax in relation to other characters and the status quo. Tewksbury takes his place as a politician. Everyone's happy. Why, even the streets of London are less chaotic in the Tewksbury case's aftermath. I love movies so much. Sherlock takes over as an oldest guardian, completing his arc, and he tries to lure out his wayward ward. She brews handy to outwitting her brothers once again. And finally, a tight focus on the protagonist in contrast from the opening. Enola alone faces her young, naive self. Enola alone bases her tainted idol. Enola alone bases her destiny as a detective, a decipherer, and finder of lost souls. And there you have it. My first example to support my argument that all movies follow the exact same 29 point story structure, regardless of how the writer approaches their craft. Nola Holmes is only the first piece of evidence I'd like to submit. It's a fun, cheeky, family-friendly outing. But is it a structural twin to something entirely different in every other way? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Please subscribe to stay up to date with this and future videos, and please like and comment with your thoughts and reactions. I'll talk at you next time.